We are continuing our study of how Christians behave, a study of the Ten Commandments, and tonight we're going to explore the purpose of the law. If you ask, as with anything else, if you ask Christians an answer to a question, you get 5,000 different answers, um, and they're all based on the Bible, you know? Um, I have met Christians who believe that the law is an instrument of salvation and you have to keep the law or you're going to hell. And by hell, I mean fiery torture for eternity. I've met other Christians who say, well, we're that's the old covenant, we're under the new covenant, none of that applies to us. Now, uh, there are no ethics to live by as Christians, just faith in Jesus. All is fair now. You can live as you please, and everything is peachy with God. Uh, since, since Christ has dealt with all the sins of the world, then it doesn't really matter. You can just, you know, sin to your heart's content. So what does the Bible actually teach? What does the church say? What what is a, a good, sound, logical, biblical understanding of the purpose of the law? That's what we're going to look at tonight. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying I find it interesting that we even have the Old Testament at all in our canon. I mean, I mean, why not? You know, there's a new religion starting. There's Christianity. There's a new covenant. Why not just toss the whole thing away? Why do we even need Genesis, Leviticus, all the rules. Why do we need the writings of the prophets? Why do we need any of that? Let's just, let's just. How about we just take the New Testament and toss everything else aside? And 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 in fact, that's exactly what one of the earliest heretics did. His name was Marcion. He died about the year 160, more or less, and he's recognized as the first great heretic in Christian history. And what Marcion taught was that the Old Testament is the story of a completely different deity, Jehovah, unrelated to Jesus, not the father of the son, this other God, a lesser God, and we just need to reject everything that has anything to do with him. So Marcion tossed out the entire Old Testament. He also tossed out Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they quote the Old Testament. He also tossed out the book of James, the writings of Peter. He tossed out the book of Hebrews because it's not the Old Testament. <laughs> and he tossed out a chunk of what St. Paul had to say. So in other words, what, what Marcion ended up with was a very tiny Bible that only focused on the things he wanted to focus on. Tossing out the Old Testament is not the answer. Jesus said this, contrary to Marcion, in Matthew chapter 5, which, by the way, the, the, the gospel lesson for tonight when we celebrate Mass is the Beatitudes. This is following right on the Beatitudes. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Paul, known as the apostle of grace, says this about the law. Romans chapter 3. Do we nullify the law by our faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Romans chapter 7, Paul said, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So the problem that Jesus, Paul, the apostles, the early church, the problem that they had with the law was not that the law existed. The problem they had with the law was the misuse of the law by the religious powers of the day. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We know that the law 
is good if one uses it properly. Now, I can tell you, no offense to anyone, but, <laughs> but I can tell you, growing up, the law was not used properly in my life. In my religious culture, the law was not used properly. The law was used to, uh, to instigate fear, to set this standard that I had to strive for, and if I didn't reach it, I lived in fear of damnation. So what is the proper use of the law? Paul said, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Let me tell you the improper use of the law first. The improper use of the law, which many Christians have done, is to see the law as an instrument of salvation. And there's a couple of reasons there are problems with that. The law, <clears throat> let me tell you, let me tell you what I was taught in Bible college. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I was taught in Bible college. And the first 30 years of my life, this is kind of where I was. In the Old Testament, people were saved by keeping the law. In the New Testament, people are saved by grace. Well, it was called dispensationalism. And there are these different eras, these different dispensations, where God deals with people differently. So in the Old Testament, all about the law, and if you kept the law, you're saved. New Testament, about grace. No, 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 no. Nobody ever, from Adam till the end, nobody ever has been saved by the law. The law was never given as an instrument or a tool or a mechanism for salvation. Again, Romans chapter 3, Paul. No one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So what Paul says is the law serves To show me my shortcomings. The law serves to tell Ken that he has some inadequacies, inadequacies in his life, that he's not all that and a bag of french fries, you know, he's he's bag of chips. He's he's got problems, he's got shortcomings, he's got failures, he has humanity. And the law shows me that I'm not perfect. Paul says in Galatians 2, 16, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law can't save us because we can't keep the law. It, it, it's a completely wrong paradigm anyway. I don't have time to get into it tonight, but, but that way of thinking at all, that salvation has something to do with, with keeping rules, is, is wrong. But if we were to pretend for a minute that the law is an instrument of salvation, if I just keep this, I'm saved, we're toast already because none of us can keep it. Christ is the only one who kept it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Name a great Old Testament man or woman of God. Sarah, Abraham, Moses, David, Hannah, Deborah, Isaiah, name any of them. None of them were saved. And by saved, I mean brought into union with God. None of them were saved by keeping the law. None of them kept the law. But the law does reflect the character of God. Ephesians chapter 2, you all know this verse, verse 8. 
By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of man, not of works, lest any man should boast. When St. Paul says the righteous shall live by faith, he's actually quoting the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk. Living by faith isn't a New Testament alone concept. Living by faith is what it's all about, walking in relationship with God himself and not thinking that we achieve his favor by keeping all the rules and never failing. So, purpose of the law. Number one, to show us that we need help. It points us to Jesus. It's this list, the Ten Commandments. Let's just stick with the Ten Commandments. I haven't kept them. You haven't kept them. Well, I kept most of them. I kept all but four. Or I've kept all but two. Or I've kept all but one. James, the brother of Jesus, describes the law as a vase. He doesn't say that. I'm saying that. Ken Myers, leaning on James, describes the law as a vase. Here's the thing. You take a beautiful, beautiful, nice vase. It's got a handle. It has a spout, a lip. And if I accidentally bump it and I chip the lip of it off, I didn't just break the lip. I broke the whole thing. It's a broken vase now. The law is a whole. The Ten Commandments are a whole. If I break one, I've broken the whole thing. And everybody's broken one or two or three or ten. So, James, I have it written down somewhere, and I can't find it. Somewhere, James says, if you've broken the law in the least, you've broken it completely. So the law, first of all, is there to show me that I am inadequate, that I am incapable of, in my own self, achieving that perfection and being in complete union with God. I need help. And Jesus is that help. Jesus, on our behalf, reconciles us to the Father and Creator. But the second purpose of the law, and this is the one I really wanted to get to tonight, and this is, I think, the most important thing in the lesson tonight. There's a second purpose. If one uses it properly, St. Paul says, what is the proper use of the law? Number one, it's a checklist that I don't measure up to. But number two, this is a good one. This is more important. There is this principle in all of life and in pretty much all religions of cause and effect. The Eastern religions call it karma. Jesus said, you reap what you sow. Garbage in, garbage out. The reality is, the reality is in your life, if you do stupid things, you're going to reap stupid consequences. If you do bad things, you're going to reap bad consequences. People, people didn't get where they got in life without making some choices along the way that got them there. Cause and effect. Reap what you sow. The law is an instrument of making good choices so that we reap good benefits. So let me let me let me go through this with you. 
Have no other gods before me. You shall not bow down to false idols. Don't misuse the name of the Lord. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. These 10 principles given by God to the people of Israel are not arbitrary rules that God just threw out there to see if they could keep it. The purpose of the law, the reason God gives it to them is as an instrument for bringing blessings into your life, for bringing good things into your life, cause and effect. Do this, this good stuff will happen to you. So let me run through some scriptures and just listen. Deuteronomy 5.22 Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Everybody said live and prosper. Live and prosper. Thank you. Deuteronomy 29 Carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything that you do. Joshua 1.8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. 2 Chronicles chapter 31, in everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly and so he prospered. Psalm 1-3, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner. I'm quoting King James because that's how I memorized it. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he doth meditate day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. So, we're Christians. We're not under the law, as the scriptures teach. It is not an instrument of salvation. Then why do it? Why keep the law? Because your life will be better if you do. These are not just arbitrary, hey, let's throw out a bunch of rules for them to keep. No, no. Uh, don't commit adultery. That'll make your marriage work better. Don't steal. That'll make your your relationships with your community better. Don't bear false. All of these, they make life better if you do them. You prosper. You live longer. You live. Show me a, a people, a family, a church, a culture, a nation that says we are going to follow this path. And I'll show you a people, a church, a family, a nation, a culture that is blessed. Because doing these things brings about good benefits. Show me a culture that doesn't, or a family that doesn't, that just throws that to the wind, and I'll show you a family, or a person, or a culture, or a nation, or a church that is so screwed up, so messed up, not enjoying life, not enjoying the benefits of Union with God. Because they're putting garbage in and they're getting garbage out. It may not happen overnight. These laws are not given to individuals. They're given to people, to a group, to a culture, to a family, to a nation. So, I may honor my father and my mother and die at the age of 35 and not live long. Honor your father and your mother that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's not given to individuals. That's talking to a people. But give me a culture that honors its elders and I'll show you a culture that's more blessed than a culture that doesn't honor its elders. So it's not an overnight thing. It's not, it's not a put the coin in the slot and pull it and you win. It's a long-term thing. We're in this for the long haul. But if we as a people follow the commandments, 
it brings blessing, goodness, positive. We reap the good. So I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to read you a quick story and then we'll be done. How do you really keep the law? True obedience consists of three things. Number one, motivation. Why am I keeping these rules? Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Upon my heart. I have to have obedience in my heart, not just externally, not just keeping the rules for the sake of keeping the rules. I have to be motivated from a place of pure intention. So the first thing is motivation. Why am I doing this? Why am I keeping I, I've known people. I bet you that too. I've known people that 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 think, well, I've I've lived. I've done some pretty crappy things. I've done some pretty stupid things. Uh, I've made some bad, selfish choices. But I really need a blessing from God. So you know, for the next little while, I'm going to keep the rules. It doesn't work that way. It has to be sincere. It has to be from the heart. Secondly, standards. We have to have something to obey, and those standards are the commandments that God gave us. 1 John chapter 2. The man who says, I know him, but does not, does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's coming from the disciple of love. We have to have integrity in why we're doing it, and the standards are the commands that he gives us. And finally, application. These commandments have to be applied. And what I'm going to say right now is kind of going, it's, it's a fool's errand. It's kind of going to the edge of the cliff and dangling there. Sometimes the spirit of the law is more important than the letter of the law. The letter of the law says this person committed adultery, stone her. The spirit of the law is about reconciliation and healing and making a person whole. So Jesus didn't stone the woman taken in adultery. In fact, he dismissed those who were ready to stone her, ready to keep the letter of the law. St. Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I can show you examples all throughout the, the Bible where people did things that were not in keeping with the letter of the law and God just said, way to go. For example, the prostitute named Rahab. Rahab takes in the Israeli spies, hides them, and when the enemy comes to her bordello, I always wonder what those spies were doing there to begin with. But, but when the enemy comes to her place of business and says, have you seen these guys? Haven't laid eyes on them. Haven't seen, I don't know who you're talking about. Nope, haven't seen them. Let's them down in a basket and they escape. And the Bible says God blessed her for what she did. It certainly was not in the letter of the law what she did, but it certainly was keeping with the spirit of the law. And this prostitute even gets mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hallmark of faith, the, the, the faith hall of fame, 
where the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab goes on to become the ancestor of King David and the ancestor of Jesus. Follow the letter, follow the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law, by the way, is the spirit of Christ. The spirit of the law is the Holy Spirit. So, I want to end with this, and I probably have told you this before, but maybe some folk watching this have not heard it, and it bears repeating. Keep these commandments that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you may prosper. Live and prosper. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Spock, Spock, the Vulcan. That's the Vulcan thing. If you're not a Trekkie, I'm really sorry for what you missed in your life, but Spock, <laughs> his, he, what he would say, live long and prosper. And he'd make that sign. That's the Vulcan sign for live long and prosper. Leonard Nimoy was an Orthodox Jew. To the day he died, a practicing Orthodox Jew. Grew up going to synagogue. where the rabbi would lift his hand and make the Hebrew letter Shin. It's the first letter of the word Shaddai, which means Almighty, and speak a blessing over the people. I'm going to read this to you from a, uh, an article written in the Jewish journal called Bima Mia, Scotty. Ready? And then we'll be done. When Leonard Nimoy was creating Mr. Spock character for Star Trek in 1966, he remembered a thrilling moment from his childhood, Orthodox synagogue. It was Yom Kippur. And the Kohenim, the, the rabbi, the priest, representatives of the priestly tribe swayed on the bima. The bima is a sea, it's a it's a, a platform. Their long talapot draped over their heads, their fingers spread in a V-shape. These men didn't say the blessing. They shouted it, Nimoy said, in his resonant, gravelly voice. They chanted and wailed, and everyone had their eyes covered. And my father said to me, don't look. Of course, being eight years old, I peeked. And I saw them doing this with their hands, and it was very chilling, passionate, ecstatic, fervent, theatrical. That's where it comes from. Here's the full Aaronic blessing, the full blessing that God commanded Aaron, the high priest, to speak over the people. Numbers chapter 6. Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Deuteronomy 6. Or rather, number 6. So, Nimoy knew, Spock knew what the purpose of the law was. The purpose of keeping the rules is not to gain God's favor. The purpose of keeping the rules is not to gain salvation. The purpose of keeping the rules is not to go to heaven. The purpose of keeping the rules is that you may live long and prosper in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Amen.